I'm Eric Beavers. The necessity to make this video just came up and it's something I've discussed in the past in the erection help videos, but due to some recent events, uh, really two things specifically, I really think a dedicated video is necessary. What I'm about to discuss is gonna sound worrisome, uh, but it's not. I really struggled deciding if it was a good idea to make it or not, but, but ultimately, the success of our customers' projects and their safety is, is something I just find absolutely crucial. First, just a quick statement. A Great Western has never had a structural failure uh, with, with any of our buildings. It, let, let me say that again and, and clarify. With, with well over 2,500 buildings sold, Great Western has never had a building come down to limited design or issues with manufacturing. In, in fact, our buildings, as is true with most pre-engineered metal buildings out there, uh, they're designed in a way for them to exceed the maximum load requirements they're, they're actually designed for. And most of this is baked into the code with safety factors. What we call safety factors really starts with the American Institute of Steel Construction, or the AISC. Uh, they regulate the capacity specifications on the raw steel. I, I don't know exactly what the margin is, but structural steel is well underrated for what we could actually expect in the real world. When it comes to design, there are additional factors that are spelled out in the building codes. Uh, that require additional safety margins. Uh, generally, we're talking about margins of around 20% or more, uh, just in conforming and required design standards. With all of that said, a building frame is not designed to handle any loads until the project is complete. I think this should be obvious to everyone, but what I'm talking about here is that while you're erecting your building, care needs to be taken to make sure that your framing structure can handle unexpected weather conditions during construction. Mostly we're concerned with wind, but a seismic event, uh, an earthquake, could have the same impact on a frame system that's not properly supported during construction. Our erection manual that we supply with every building order goes into detail about proper bracing techniques during construction. And this is a good resource and it should be studied prior to starting your building construction. So what am I actually talking about here? And why is it so important for me to get this video out now? Well, I'm about to share some photos with you of two projects of ours uh, that came down in wind events while they were being constructed. Uh, both came down due to high winds, but the fundamental cause was different. W one came down due to a very, very poor foundation, and the other came down to uh, uh, neglectful erecting. Uh, both of these customers hired out their construction, so I'm not suggesting they did anything wrong themselves. <laughs> if I were to ever be asked, I, I wouldn't be very kind uh, talking about the erectors here. Uh, I'll also put a couple of links in the description down below about some high-profile construction failures unrelated to Great Western. Fortunately, on the two buildings I'm about to share, uh, no one was working at the time, so no one got hurt. However, as you'll see, if you check out the links down there, uh, unsafe erection techniques can be deadly. Here's our first example. This is the only photograph the customer took prior to, to dismantling the fallen steel. However, a, a lot can be determined from this picture alone. In, in the photo, we can see that the building's rigid frame columns and rafters were all erected prior uh, to the insulation of any of the roof purlins. This is very wrong. Uh, rigid frame columns and rafters can, can be fairly deep and will catch wind like a sail. Uh, this is especially true on high snow load buildings like this one or wider spans. Uh, wider spans and heavier load requires deeper web sections just to, you know, to carry that load. This building's only a 36 foot span, uh, but it was designed to carry a full 60 pound per square foot roof snow load. Um, and as we can see in the photo, no bracing was installed and only a single leaf strut on the back wall was installed. Uh, this means that these frames and the rafters were only supported by the anchor bolts at the base of the column. I spoke with a customer in detail about this, and, and from what I could figure out, uh, or what I was told, the erector had left the job site for that day, and a big thunderstorm rolled through. 
Uh, if you've been paying attention to the news in Denver, Front Range in Colorado has had some uh, pretty significant thunderstorms. Uh, no estimates on the wind speed, but 40 to 50 mile an hour gusts aren't uncommon. Without any bracing or purlin installed, there's simply no way for the framing system to transfer that, that wind load to the foundation. So beyond the obvious common sense stuff, like, like using guy bracing when the frames are hanging uh, without girts and purlins, uh, how do we avoid a situation like this? Uh, simple. A and this is most important on the sidewalls, but it should also be done with the end walls as well. Once a column is erected, the column or the immediate next column that will be joined to it with secondary framing should be installed and then have the secondary girt system along with the eave strut that sits on top of the column uh, installed immediately. Then the columns and girts on the opposite wall should be fully installed before moving to the rafters. Never hang rafters until the building columns are completely secure. If the building has a portal or X bracing uh, in some of the bays, those bays should be installed first. When it comes to the rafters, peak purlins should be installed as soon as possible and then the immediate or the intermediate purlins after that. I'm not trying to turn this into a tri tips and tricks video, uh, but if you can put the wider flange on the bottom when you install those first purlins, this will just help with purlin nesting later when the next bay is installed. Uh, unless you have a large crew and, and the appropriate equipment to build a roof bay on the ground, uh, you'll have to raise one rafter at a time. Uh, that means we're gonna leave one rafter in, in, in what I would call naked condition. Uh, without the other rafter to tie into uh, with purlins, there's nothing to support it laterally. So you'll need to brace the peak of the rafter from both sides. Uh, longer span buildings may need additional intermediate bracing to, sc to secure that rafter. Uh, when I was erecting, we, I'd simply pound a T-post into the ground outside of the building and use a uh, like half-inch static climbing rope for temporary bracing. Uh, if the building has a slab or a T-post, uh, cannot be driven into the ground because the foundation or just outside, uh, we would tie off to a piece of equipment or something else heavy enough to prevent the rafter from swaying in the wind. I, I would also recommend installing the purlin flange bracing at this time as well. Uh, the flange brace will act as a knee and supply uh, some rigidity to help out. Once all of this is installed, we can move down the building to the next bay and follow the same procedure. Columns first, then girts, eave struts, then a rafter, purlins and flange bracing as soon as the rafter is in. Like I said, it's mostly common sense, but it can be easy to get ahead of yourself or if the wind is light in the morning to just not give it a second thought until you know later in the day when the wind picks up. Our next example is a bit more detailed because of the photos we have. But besides the wind event, the true cause has a lot more to do with the foundation. Uh, but, but we do see a lot of other problems with the bracing and installation that I'll go over. I, I think on this one, even if only the building bracing, the flange bracing, and lat bolts would have been used and installed, uh, or if the foundation would have been sufficient, uh, these frames would have never come down. Uh, I mean, where do I even start on this one? Uh, when, I, when I first received the photos, the first thing I noticed was that the contractor, who, who did both the concrete work and the steel erection, uh, primarily use wedge anchors to secure the columns to the foundation. Uh, <laughs> guys, this is 101 stuff, and I've gone over it many other times. Wedge anchors are never to be used for structural columns, period. Uh, I mean, I've seen people get away with it, but, but it's not worth it. Port in place or epoxy bolts are really the only option. Uh, also, in order to save some money, and because it just wasn't needed for a permit, uh, this customer elected to not have us or another engineer uh, design the foundation. Uh, instead, the contractor just poured what he felt was sufficient. Uh, I'll go over the deficiencies relating to the foundation first, and, and then I'll quickly go over the bracing issues. Please understand that this framing system sat on the ground for several months prior to the photos being taken. Uh, the rusty condition of the frame is, is due to sitting for a large part of the winter covered in snow uh, rather than the way it was shipped. Uh, here we can see that four short wedge anchors were used on the end wall columns. This is a bit bizarre uh, to me because there were only two 11 16th inch holes in that base plate uh, for 5 8 inch anchor rods per our design. I, I think the erector knew better and decided to add some additional wedge anchors uh, to the column bases. Uh, I, either way, these bolts are only a few inches deep into the concrete and, and they're not being used in an application uh, that they were designed for or I should say they, they're being used in an application that they weren't designed for. Um, this is what I consider to be the most telling picture we received. So many issues here, 
On this rigid frame, port and place J bolts were used. Uh, because there isn't a foundation design, uh, I can't be sure, uh, but, but they do appear to be a bit shorter than what I would normally expect to see on something like this. Uh, the, the reason this photo is so telling and what we're able to determine at the job site or confirm at the job site is two things. First, it's a cold joint. The, the stem wall or perimeter concrete was poured first. Uh, the block of concrete still attached to the column was poured afterwards, creating a cold joint. Uh, additionally, as you can see from the bottom of that block flaring out in the photo, uh, it was poured directly on top of the ground next to the stem. There is no rebar cage around the bolts and there's no rebar tying the block of concrete into the rest of the foundation. All we have here is a 16 by 16 inch block of concrete holding this entire end of the frame down. The torch cut J bolts are a nice touch. Uh, we were unable to determine if any rebar was used in the rest of the concrete. Uh, it, hadn't been, it hadn't been demolished yet. Uh, I, either way, it's, it's obviously not all tied together. Foundation designs are inexpensive. They give you a clear set of engineered instructions and some peace of mind. Unlike most building companies that I'm aware of, Great Western regularly includes these for our customers. And just to give you an idea on affordability, we would have only charged about 800 bucks to design the foundation on this building. Of course, the contractor would have to have followed those, uh, follow those plans up. Uh, however, I, I do understand that every dollar our customers can save really adds up. But with stuff like this, I just don't think it's worth it. Let's get into the bracing and the mechanism uh, that brought this frame down. Uh, we can see in the photos that none of the X bracing was installed with the building. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the X bracing and panels here uh, towards the end of the video. Um, but we can also see that none of the flange bracing was installed between the frame and the secondary members. <laughs> Although I have no evidence to support this, it's just my experience, would have been the install installation of the purlin lap bolts. A unique part of a pre-engineered building is the use of overlapping structural components. Uh, this won't apply to a buildings that have a flush wall or girt system, but it is standard on the vast majority of the projects that we do. Uh, flush buildings use a different, heavier design features to achieve the same building stiffness, but I digress. Uh, depending on the design, purlins and girts overlap each other anywhere from two to eight feet. Uh, one foot, one foot would be a two foot lap, or two and two, or four and four. And they're bolted together at the ends of the overlaps. Eight foot laps can sometimes have five sets of bolts. One set on each end, an intermediate set, and then the set that ties both purlins into the rafter clip. Uh, structurally, the overlap only works if it's bolted together at the ends. Here it wasn't. Uh, once installed, this adds a tremendous amount of strength and rigidity to the frame. Uh, here we can see that while the purlins were lapped, they were not actually bolted together uh, at the ends. I, I assume the erector was going to do this work when he was installing the flange bracing, but just never got around to it. Uh, without the lap bolts installed, the only thing the clip bolts in the center did was just act as a pivot point. Still a very strong connection, but once the foundation failed, it was all over. Another quick hit on the, anchor, uh, on the anchoring. Anchor bolts should be the absolute last thing to fail. Uh, the reactions we provide are severely overdesigned and are essentially calculated assuming perfect storm conditions. Uh, we call this load combination. When we create the anchor bolt reactions, we are calculating a full combination of all the loads. Full snow, full live load, full wind load, full seismic, all acting together. Uh, simply put, the base plate of the column should rip off the, the end of that column before an anchor rod ever pulls out or shears. I, I know this is becoming one of my super long videos, uh, but, but I wanna keep going a little bit. I, I'll just try to keep it short from here. I think an obvious question, someone not familiar with PEMB or pre engineered metal building design um, or, or building erection would be, gee, Eric, if, if a frame can fall down in the wind, wouldn't that become an even bigger issue once the walls are installed? I mean, after all, uh, they're going to catch a lot more wind than the web of a rafter. Uh, embracing be damned. Um, I, obviously, the answer is yes. Uh, the walls are going to catch a lot more wind load than just the bare frame. However, once the building is complete with all of the bracing and, and most importantly, the panels, uh, the building becomes incredibly strong, e even with the added surface area to catch the wind. Panels provide what we call diaphragm to the building. Uh, the best way to think of this is, is the same as a two by four, two by stick, stick frame wall, uh, just toothpicks. Uh, however, once the sheeting, plywood or metal panels, whatever is applied, you get a tremendous amount of strength. 
I, I once argued with our engineer about bracing, wrongly thinking uh, that the X bracing uh, was more structurally sound uh, for, for lateral movement. But, R but Richard, being a professional engineer and really knowing his stuff, uh, showed me the math. Uh, speaking in broad terms, panel shear or, or diaphragm bracing is an order of magnitude stronger than any X brace, uh, so long as the wall is 50% uh, or more sheeted. In a wind event, the sheeting transfers all of the load through the fastening system, and uh, for the most part, uh, X bracing cable or rod and portal frames are, are used mostly uh, to help out with plumbing the structure during construction or just to meet a building authority code requirement. So to wrap this video up, I, I just have a couple of points. Uh, don't skip on the foundation. It's not worth it. And, and even though I've done it myself and I've gotten away with it, uh, never get comfortable and, and just leave it for the night or, or the weekend. Please properly secure your building frame while you're constructing it. Uh, affordable is a subjective term, but these buildings are not cheap. But besides staying safe, uh, insurance companies really get bummed out over claims like this. I, I really hope this video is helpful and, and isn't stopping you from erecting your own building or deciding to go with a pre-engineered metal building, whether that's a Great Western or something from someone else. Out of, out of many thousands of buildings that we've done over the years, the, these are the only two that had the frames come down, uh, but because they were less than, they're like eight months apart, I, I really feel like I should discuss the proper erection sequence again. Uh, just this time to highlight the consequences of cutting corners. As always, build great, and if you have any questions about your GWB building or steel buildings in general, please leave a comment, uh, and I'll try to respond personally, or you can always just give us a call. Thanks, and I'll see you again.